All right, Dr. Wynn here. I want to talk to you a little bit about one technique for a lower third wisdom tooth extraction, tooth number 32. A patient comes in with a history of pericordinitis, swelling, pain, can't fall asleep due to the pain. All RBAs are discussed at length, including the risk of paresthesia. As you can see, the proximity of tooth number 32 <clears throat> is much closer to the IA nerve than tooth number 17 is. And that's all annotated here on the photo and discussed with the patient at length. Patient elects extraction over attempting to SRP for a period of time over and over again due to the history of pericoronitis. All right, so I wanna to talk to you about a couple techniques, okay? There's a few different techniques you can do, but all of them start with elevating. Now here, unfortunately, this tooth, we're not able to elevate distally very much at all, about maybe half a millimeter or so. I'm not able to elevate very much more to the distal due to the sending ramus blocking our tooth from that distal movement. So we actually have to go to forceps a little bit sooner than we would like. But as long as you're very judicial with your initial movements with your forceps, you should be able to gain mobility slowly but surely. Okay, now there's a number of different techniques you can do here. You can section the tooth. You can actually stand from a 12 o'clock position and have the forceps with your right hand and then use your left hand to stabilize the ridge and to stabilize the mandible, which is actually recommended. Okay, because if you can stabilize the mandible with your left hand standing in a 12 o'clock position, you can one, feel the bony expansion with your fingers, your forefinger and your thumb. And you can actually move the two teeth in a way that's not moving the whole head. As, he, as you can see here, the whole head is moving whenever I move the forcep. That's because I don't have a good handle on the jaw or the head, but the reason why I went ahead and did this position is so I can get a good visual for the video and talk about the downsides of not having a good hold on the mandible, okay? So here, the, the tooth is out. We went ahead and attempted to do a figure eight and conical motions. Now here, I'd like to pause and show you where the forceps ended up at after the extraction. I would like you to actually, if you have time, take a couple seconds after the tooth is extracted from your next extraction and see where the forceps are located, okay? If it's located very high, like here in the red, then you, you could ask yourself, hey, did I have the forceps all the way down to where I needed to have it? Here, the bone was in the way, therefore I couldn't move that forcep more apical, okay? In best case scenario, I can get the forceps right here, near closer to the CEJ, okay? But here, due to the bone displacing our forcep, I'm not able to get it any deeper, all right? Which increases the risk of fracture, of course. So that's another thing to consider. Now, again, in this technique, just for visualization purposes, I went ahead and did it at, at about an eight to nine o'clock position to the patient. So the issue with that is that the whole head and the whole mandible moves. So you're really not getting as much movement as you think. So instead of doing my normal figure eight motion, I had to go ahead and move the forceps in a conical motion in a clockwise and hold it there. And then a counterclockwise and hold it there. Now you need to hold it there for much longer than you would think for the bony expansion to occur, but that will actually help separate the interceptal bone out of the mandible, okay? So there you have it. Thank you for watching. And again, I want to reiterate that as a practitioner, you need to take in all of the considerations before you jump into any extraction, okay? Thank you.